Glad to see everybody here this morning. I hope that you're having a wonderful Lord's Day today. Uh, we've got a few visitors uh, with us. we got some folks back with us. We won't call visitors, uh, but we're glad to have, uh, have a lot of them uh, here with us today. Uh, certainly want to, uh, want to keep in mind all the folks that we've mentioned earlier who are in need of prayers, uh, especially Brother Franks. He's going in for surgery tomorrow, so we definitely want to uh, want to do that. Of course, we've got a lot of folks that are on the road traveling, still got a lot of folks sick, so we uh, certainly want to keep up uh, with all of them. Uh, but today we're going to continue our lesson on Back to Basics, and, and we're going to talk about the aspects of worship. Um, uh, as we talked the last couple of weeks, we talked about what worship is, what God expects from us. We talked about how important it is, and, and some of the problems, some of the barriers that we can have to, to really worshiping God, uh, and ways to improve our worship to God. And today I want us to start talking about some of the aspects of of worship. And we're going to start off by talking about the Word of God. Now, uh, the Word of God is, um, is more than just one aspect of worship. There's a lot to it. Um, because of the, the nature of the Word of God, because of the importance of the Word of God, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to narrow it down to just one aspect uh, of who we are uh, as Christians, it's hard to narrow it down to, to one part of, of what we do as the children of God. And so uh, we're going to talk today uh, about the Word and about how it affects us and, and its role, if you will, uh, in, in part in our daily lives, but also in part in worship. Uh, again, because it's so hard to narrow this down, um, I, I'm going to preach in a way that I typically don't preach. I, uh, today, I, I'm going to do something that I, sometimes I really don't even like doing it, uh, but we're going to do a scripture shotgun blast today, uh, if you will, talking about the Word of God. So we've got a lot of different passages uh, that we're going to be looking at, a lot of different uh, statements that we're going to make about the Word of God. So when we start off by talking about the Word of God, one of the things that jumped out at me was found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, where uh, Luke records, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, notice I have that underlined, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayers. Now, several of the, uh, several of the acts of worship are contained here in this particular passage as to what the early church was doing. Remember, this was just after the day of Pentecost. This was just after those 3,000 were baptized, and they were starting to build up the church at that point in time. They were still in Jerusalem. The apostles were still there. The persecution hadn't gotten started. And so they were, they were really getting their footing established. And one of the things that we see that they were doing is they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, at that point, the apostles' teaching was the only word of God that was there aside from the Old Testament scriptures. And so as they were developing the, the writing of the New Testament, they were beginning to write the epistles, they were beginning to write the gospels, they were, they were laying the foundation for, for the work of the book of Acts. Remember, uh, this was very, very early on, and so the, the new writings had not yet been produced, and so they were relying on what was in the Old Testament, but they were also relying on what the apostles were teaching as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. And so even before it was written, the Word of God was being taught. The Word of God was being shared with all of the people of the church there, in particular in Jerusalem. Now, as time went by, as Paul began writing, as Peter began writing, as James began writing, and, and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jude, all of, these, all of these inspired people began writing, then we see what's commonly referred to as the canon, as what we have uh, what we have here is being developed over that period of time. And so uh, they were beginning early on teaching the Word of God. Even as we go through the book of Acts, we see in places like uh, Berea, where uh, Paul and his, uh, his companions were going and teaching, and even then, the Christians uh, who, who had a Jewish background would go to the Old Testament and they would verify what Paul and his companions were teaching, and so uh, they, were ch they were searching the scriptures to make sure that what Paul was teaching was in line with what the prophets uh, and Moses had taught beforehand. And so early on, very early on, as the word of God was developing, it was part of worship. It was part of what the people of God, uh, the followers of Christ, were doing early on. We also see in passages like Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, where Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
Now, most of you are going to see this passage again when we get to the, uh, to the lesson on what singing is all about, because this is one of the places we tend to go to the second part of the verse where we talk about singing uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But look a little higher up in that verse. Look a little earlier. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And so that teaching is associated with the Word of God. It's associated with these epistles that Paul was writing. It's associated with the Gospels that were in circulation. And it's even being associated with the songs, the psalms, uh, that were being sung at that point in time. So even here, when we attach the Word of God to the singing, we understand that they have to be together. They have to be cohesive. They have to teach the same Thing. Now, of course, we know when we get into songs, we have some poetic license and we have metaphors and different things that, that we can have in songs here, but we see that all of this has to be in conjunction with worship and in conjunction with the words that God would have us know, that he would have us learn, understand, and apply to our lives. And so he wants his people spending time meditating on his words, talking with one another, teaching one another, encouraging, admonishing one another, and then, of course, singing these songs together. So let's, not re, uh, let's remember to never separate the songs that we sing from the words that God would have us know and he would have us learn and understand. So we've got a lot going on here. And again, when we get to the lesson on singing, we're going to explore that much more deeply. But we need to remember how closely connected those things are. So as we go through our Christian lives, let us allow that word of Christ to dwell in us richly, not just a little bit, but to really live there and to really produce things in our hearts and in our lives. We also see the power of the word of God. In passages like Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, we see how important and how life-changing that word is. It says here, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And now faith, as we talked about in our Back to Basic lesson on faith several weeks ago, faith is the root. Faith is the cornerstone. Faith is where we start. Because without faith, the Hebrew writer tells us, it's impossible to please him. Without faith, none of the rest of the process works because we are called to follow him in faith. Our, our salvation is justified by our faith. All of those things work together, and where does our faith begin? Through the Word of Christ. Through the hearing of the Word of Christ. Now, when Jesus told His disciples to go into the world, go into all the world, preaching and teaching all of these things that I have shown you. He is telling them to go and to take his word and to plant the seed of that word throughout the rest of the world. And once that seed of his word is planted, once that seed hits the good hearts and the good minds of those who, who are looking toward God, what happens? Faith is generated. And that is the foundation. That is the basis where our reconciliation with God, where our peace with God comes from. All of those things are generated through and in conjunction with the Word of God. It's where our Christian life starts. It's right there with what God has given to us through the preaching and the teaching of the prophets and the apostles and through Christ. All of that starts right there. We continue on. And we see that the Word of God guides our lives. So it, the Word of God tells us what we are uh, asked to do by our Heavenly Father as far as worship goes. It, it tells us what we are asked to do as far as living our lives. It, it, tell, it, it lets us know what we are being asked to do in order to be pleasing to God. In Psalm 119, 105 through 107, we read, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Now, of course, we're not under the old law anymore, as David was when this was written. But the principles that are taught in the law and the principles that we see in the psalm still apply. We see here that the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. 
I, I know that there are times when, when you know, things go on, power goes out, you get up in the middle of the night, you're not sure where the light is, or you, or you don't want to turn the light on and wake yourself all the way up, right? You start walking through the house, and if something's not where it normally is, you step on it, you stub your toe, whatever the case might be. And so we understand in real life, in, in, the, in the material world, what it means to walk in darkness. We understand what it means to not know where our feet are going or, or what's directly in front of us. And it can be pretty scary if you don't know where you're going or, what you're step, or where you're stepping. Maybe what you're stepping on or even what you're stepping in. You want to make sure <laughs> that you can see what's going on right there in front of you. And spiritually speaking, we need to have that type of vision as well. We need to know where we're going. We need to know what we're doing. We need to know where our solid footing is. In here and out there. And so when we spend time studying the Word, when we spend time in the Scriptures, reading it, studying it, discussing it, asking questions, answering questions, exploring the depths of the Scripture, we begin to know and we begin to understand more and more of what God wants from us and where we need to go. Even Jesus told his disciples, I'm going home, John 14. I paraphrase it. He says, I'm going home and, and I'm going to go there and I'm going to prepare a place for you and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and the disciples didn't understand. They said, where are you going? And he says, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. How do we know how to get there? Well, because he told us and he showed us that path a little further down in Psalm 119 or a little back up a little in Psalm 119 verse 33 and 37. We, through 37, we see, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Even there, David is telling us that the life that we should desire to live, the life that we should delight in, is found in the words of God. Now, of course, we know David went off the rails a couple of pretty bad times. We know that he caused himself a lot of trouble and he caused Israel a lot of heartache, but those things happened when he departed from the word of God. When he went after the things to satisfy sin and to satisfy self, that's when David left God's words and the problems that he had when he was away from God are tremendous. But yet here he is understanding and recognizing that in order to guide his steps, in order to, in order to do what was pleasing to God, in order to do what was right in his own life, he needed God's words. And nothing has changed since the time of David as far as that goes. We still need God's words. Even the prophet Jeremiah mentioned uh, that we don't know even how to take a step. We don't know where to go unless God directs us through his word. We continue on and looking at James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Now, one of the things about the words of God, once you hear them, you have to take some kind of action. You have to do something with it. Now, I'm not a big fan when somebody says we ought to do something. I'm not a big fan of just doing something. We have to do the right thing. And so James here is telling us when we are confronted with the Word of God, we have to do what God is asking us to do. Starting in verse 22, he says, But be doers of the Word, that's the Word of God, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if, any, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. And then you go on through the passage and he talks about the fact that once you know what you look like, if there's something wrong, you should try to fix it. I always like the illustration of, of the mustard smear on somebody's face. You don't go to the bathroom and, and look in the mirror and you see mustard smeared down the side of your face. You go, oh, okay, I've got mustard. And then turn around and leave. You fix it, right? You do something with it. 
Well, here's the idea behind the Word of God. Once we are confronted with the Word of God, once we see what God wants from us in our life, we have to do something with it. Because if we just hear it and don't take action, it doesn't do anything for us. One of the things that has come about in the last five or ten years, maybe even a little further back than that, at least I've been paying attention to it for about ten years, is this uh, awareness posting online. If you spend any time online on any type of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever the case might be, people will put up a, a pink background on a picture and say, cancer awareness. And then they'll put up a, a, a different color background and, it, and it's this kind of awareness. And then they'll put up another one and say it's this kind of awareness. And then, and then they'll put up another one and say it's this kind of awareness. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, that's great. Everybody's aware now. What are you actually doing? And I've had people tell me, well, I'm, I'm spreading awareness. Okay? But what are you actually doing? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm spreading awareness. I think you're missing the point of my question. What are you actually doing? We hear the Word of God. We may memorize a passage. Great. We may know what that passage actually means. It's even better. We may be able to quote that passage to somebody else. Keep going. We may even be able to tell them what that passage means when we quote it to them. That's great. But what are you really doing? Am I letting the Word of God change how I worship? Am I letting the Word of God change how I live? Am I letting the Word of God change who I am? Christianity is a come-as-you-are religion, but Christianity is not a stay-as-you-are religion. You have to be somebody different. You have to be something different. You have to worship in a different way than you would have before you ever came in contact with that Word. Are you doing what God has asked for you to do. That path is now illuminated before you. Are you walking down it? The deeds that God wants you to do are there enumerated for you. Love God. Love your neighbor. What else do you need to know? Are you doing that? What God wants from you in worship is listed right there. Are you doing those things? Once you hear that word, it should transform your life. Just like we said from Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Once you hear that word of God, you should not just be a hearer only. If you are just a, an awareness person, if you're just telling others uh, that you know what's going on and you're not doing anything about it, James says you're deceiving yourself. Are you ready to do what God has asked you to do? Are you ready to take that word into your heart and let it change who you are? For he looks at himself and goes away, at once forgets what he was like. But the one, continuing on here, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. God calls us to be transformed. How can we offer him our worship if we have not allowed his word to transform us? How can we offer him our worship if we are not spending time studying his word? How can we worship if we are not drawing closer to him and to the message that he has left for us. And oh, I'm here to tell you, it is so easy today. It's so easy. We, we've got leather bound, it's not, I don't have a red letter edition, but it's leather bound, it's got commentary, I've got a bookmark, I've got all sorts of reference tools, I've got all sorts of stuff right here in front of me. 
Did you know a thousand years ago Bibles were so expensive and so rare that they would actually lock and chain them to a pulpit so they didn't walk off? That they would actually have in libraries where these books were bound and chained to shelves so people didn't come in and take them and walk off? They were so rare. And Friday night, I was downtown just before the storm and, and before the, the, the band was playing at the gazebo there, and there was a guy who was walking around. I don't agree with their policy religiously in all cases, but he was part of a group that hands out Bibles. And he was walking around, and he had that little New Testament in his hand, and he couldn't give them all away. Literally couldn't give them all away. Man, how far have we come? where we are so progressed as a society that we can't even give somebody a Bible. We are so spoiled. Let's take that word and let's continue to let it change our life so that we can look into that perfect law of liberty and be blessed in our doing as we seek to follow the will and the words of our Heavenly Father. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 verses 15 and 16 tells us that we need to do your or tells us do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth some old tra older translations say dividing rightly uh, portioning it properly handling it properly handling the word of God Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6 that we as Christians have one offensive weapon to go on the fight against Satan, and that weapon is the Word of God. There's a, uh, a lesson that I taught back at Gonzales several years ago. I have, uh, if you've been to my house, one of the very first things I'm going to show you is my collection of swords and knives, okay? <laughs> So if, and so I brought several of those swords to, to church one night so I could present a lesson. It was primarily designed for the kids, and I've had this big, heavy, two-handed sword. And I hadn't taken good care of that sword. It's rusted, it's marked up, it's heavy with my shoulder. It'd be hard for me to swing. And, and so that's what happens when we neglect the Word of God. We can't handle it properly. We neglect it. We fail to practice with it. We fail to handle ourselves and we fail to handle it. And once we get there and it's time to go, it's time to use this word, it's time to know what God wants from us in a situation or when somebody asks a question, we have to know what the word says so we can handle it properly. I may not know the answer to every question that I'm asked. I don't know the answer to every question that I'm asked, but I can tell you where to go to find it. I can point you in the right direction. I have to tell you one of the most shameful moments, and it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of shameful. I asked my kids one day, my kids one day, why do we not have instrumental music in the church? And you know what the answer was? One of my children looked at me and said, because it's against the Bible. No. <laughs> no. I failed. Where did I go wrong? We have to learn to handle rightly the word of truth so that we are not ashamed at that time when God appears. We know what the answer is. The answer is his word. The answer is his love. The answer is our faith in him. All of those things are rooted and founded in his word. And once we know how to handle that word, we can become that soldier that he needs us to be on his battlefield, wielding that sword of the spirit properly to remove those, those evil influences, to remove those temptations to sin, to, to get all of those things out of the way so that we can live that right and good life before Him, saved by His mercy and saved by His grace through the faith that we have in Him through His Word. You see how it all circles back? It all circles back. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul is telling Timothy here pretty much the same thing that Jesus tells us with the Great Commission. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, 
and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Preach the word. Timothy was a young evangelist who was under the tutelage and training of the Apostle Paul. And a lot of times we look at this passage and we say, okay, evangelist, okay, preacher, preach the word. Gotcha. I'll do it. This call goes to each and every one of us as well. We, once we are changed by the word of God, once we know what that word says, once we know the, the obligations and the demands that that word places upon us, once we know what we should be compelled to do, our love for our Heavenly Father, our gratitude for what He has done for us, and our faith in Him should drive us forward to preach that word. Who do you hate so much? Or who do you love so little that you would want to keep them out of heaven? Who do, we, who do we love so little that we would like for them to die in their sin? Who do we love so little that we want to withhold the only thing that can save them from their sin? I hope the answer to that question is there's nobody that I love so little. But I love all of my family. I love all of my friends. I love all of my neighbors. I love all of my coworkers. I love all of them so much that I am going to show them the words of God. I'm going to be ready in season and out of season. When it's convenient, when it's not. When I'm thinking about it and when the question comes out of the blue. Even Peter tell, tells us to be ready at all times to give an answer for the joy that it dwells within us. When you ask me the question, I need to be ready with the answer. When your eyes look on my life, I need to be living out the gospel. When it comes time, and the time is now, I need to be ready to share with all who ask the words of my God. This is more than just worship, as I said at the beginning of this lesson. You can see how each one of these passages, and there are so many more we could have talked about today. You can see how each one of these passages affect our daily life and our worship life. You can see how deeply rooted the Word of God is to be in everything we do. Just like Paul said in Colossians 3, 16, he says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it be there in everything you are and in everything you do. And also like Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If that word is dwelling in you and has generated faith in you and you are ready to take the next step of faith, if you are ready to to repent of sin that's in your life. If you are ready to confess Christ's name before men, then you are ready to be baptized in order to have those sins washed away. And once you have done that, the Word of God should continue to, to grow in your life. It should continue to change who you are and what you do. And that is when your feet are set on that path, that straight and narrow path that leads to the gates of heaven, where we are called to allow that Word to live in us richly. If you're here today and you need to be baptized in order to have your sins washed away, know that we stand ready to assist you in any way we can. If you're here and you are a child of God, but you find that His Word has not been guiding your life as it should, perhaps there's sin back in your life that you need to repent of and you're ready to ask for forgiveness, know that we stand ready to assist you with that as well. If you're here and you have either spiritual need, won't you meet me up front and let that need be made known 